Welcome everybody. I'm Steve Zizel, and I direct the Nutrition Research Institute. And you are the smart people who came here and aren't at the other building because you didn't read the notes. But I'm sure there'll be more people wandering in who went to the other building. A few of you told us, including one of our faculty members, that because they, they didn't read the full message about where it is. But we welcome you here. Thank you for coming. This is the Appetite for Life series. Uh, this year it's going to be monthly, and every month there will be an event. You can come to our website uh, at the Nutrition Research Institute, so that's nri.org, uncnri.org, and you can find it. We uh, today um, are very lucky that uh, we have um, a tag team Dr. Nick Gillett, who uh, is a uh, internationally recognized scientist who works in <laughs> <laughs> what I can tell you the secret about him is if you talk to him about football, but not American football, but British football, he is an addict. Um, he even flies there and go to a single game. a world expert on fruits and vegetables, and, and obviously um, he is located in the Dole Nutrition Institute, which is on the campus, and collaborates with us. So, uh, we've had some interesting scientific collaborations in the last year that I've been part of, and we're very happy to have. And Chef Mark Allison is here, and um, the nice part is show you some ways to use fruits and vegetables to make outstanding food. And as I understand it, some of that outstanding food will be available to you as soon as they finish their talks. So if you hang in to the end of their talks, um, I think in the lobby our staff will be setting up right. yeah. and you can make enough for all these people. Or 200 people. <laughs> some of you can have a second episode. Some of you will be able to have a second episode. Eat one, take one. Today's lecture, uh, I hope you'll enjoy. And again, come back to our series each month and look for what's going on. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to come and listen to me talk about fruits and vegetables. Um, we're going to give you a little look into the main reasons why fruits and vegetables are healthy for you. Um, but before we do that, I'll talk to you a little bit about Dole. So we are a fresh fruit and vegetable company. Um, we have revenues close to six billion. We used to have another division, uh, Packaged Foods, but we just recently sold that. So now Mr. Murdoch wants us to just sell fresh fruits and vegetables because he truly believes that anything fresh is truly, truly good for you. So he actually got rid of the packaged foods division so we can concentrate on fresh food. Um, we're in over 90 countries worldwide. We grow a lot of pineapples and bananas, so we're in that lovely little piece of the world that is just above and down the equator all the way around, uh, which is pretty nice for, for the folks that work in that area. Uh, we employ many, many people in many <coughs> different jobs all the way from agronomics and farming all the way up to distribution. He owns the ships we transport the, uh, the fruits and vegetables on, so we have sailors and merchant navy and all that kind of stuff. So he employs almost everybody. Um, and it's true to say that his vision is really to use health and nutrition as a, as a business strategy, and he has no problem doing that. Um, it's a very personal mission for him, as uh, some of you may know. His wife died of cancer many years ago, and he truly believes that that's uh, could have been averted potentially by improving their diets a, a lot younger than, uh, than he actually did. So he really believes that he can change the world and make fruits and vegetables more popular and get people to eat more so that people live longer, happier lives. So he created what's called the Dole Nutrition Institute, which is the division of Dole that I run. Uh, and we have two basic functions within the company. We have an education function, which is more or less based out in California, where Dole HQ is. 
and we have the research function which is based here on the campus. The education piece is important because it's all well and good to do scientific research, but if you can't take that information and describe it in a way that is understanding to people like you, then nobody understands and you don't get anything out of it. So it's really important that we're able to have this education piece, and we probably do it best of all the food companies. Um, as I said, it's over in California, we have our admin and program coordinators, we've got a nutrition and health communications person out there who writes the newsletter and some other things. Um, and now we have the culinary nutrition director who suddenly disappeared. But um, he's based out here in North Carolina, but he's basically attached to the California piece because that's where we do most of our education. And the hope really then uh, for Mark is to actually complete that circle. You know, we grow the fruits and vegetables and sell them. We actually do scientific research on them to show why they're healthy to you. But I always thought the bit we don't do is actually show the consumer how you incorporate more fruits and vegetables in your diet. And of course, lots of people wander through the supermarket and see all these wonderful fruits and vegetables, and they'll look at them and go, what am I supposed to do with that? How do I use kale? How do I use this and that? Mark can tell them. So what we've done is brought him into the company so that he can take these wonderful recipes, include fruits and vegetables in them, and really educate the consumer on how to incorporate fruits and vegetables into their diets. But of course, the bit I'm more involved with is the research end, and that's the piece that's based over here. We have the Dole Nutrition Institute lab, which is in the NC State building, which is the building next to Steve's. Um, and the, the important thing for us, really, is to create these collateral materials that we have for education. So it's the usual stuff, it's newsletters, it's social media, we have a nice website that we're in the process of changing now, where we're just trying to feed health and nutrition through the whole fabric of the site. It's not just a you know, product listing and what's in a banana, all that kind of stuff. We tell you a lot more than that there. Um, and we also produce brochures and books and all this kind of stuff just to try and get people to see why fruits and vegetables are healthy for you. But that's kind of what everybody else does. And Don likes to be different. And so one of the reasons that we are different is that we actually do our own scientific research. And the hope is that if you do research which is exciting enough, and it always is exciting for me as a scientist, but when I'm in exciting enough, I'm in exciting enough for other people to think it's interesting enough to start writing about it. Because if we write about it, it's advertising. And then we're subject to the FTC, and there's all sorts of regulations around health claims and all this kind of stuff. But if we do some scientific research and it gets published in a journal, and say the editor of Runner's World picks it up and starts talking about it, that's nothing to do with us. They can say what they like. And hopefully they say positive things, because we're trying to do positive studies. And hopefully that, that information is exciting enough that it makes people read the articles and try to understand why fruits and vegetables are healthy for you. So the key really is to do exciting research and get it published and have other people talk about it. So that's the kind of job I have here at the research campus. So all of that is predicated around health. So why, why is that important? Well, if you take a quick look at how many Americans die each year from any cause, you pretty much see that there's, there's quite a few, it's about two and a half million each year, split between heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, and those are the big three. 50% um, of all the deaths that occur are due to diseases that have a lifestyle and dietary component. It's something you can do something about. Diet and lifestyle is completely within your control and it's something that's really important for people to realize. If you take a quick look at how significant that lifestyle component is, it's very significant. At least 70%, 90% in the case of diabetes, that's how much your diet and lifestyle matter to you. What the other 10, 15, 20, 30% is, that's your genes, of course. Your blueprint, what, what goes on in your body. But what you do with your body, by the way of exercise, and food, and eating, is really, really important. People need to understand that. So let's take a little look at how important it is. If you take a look at the average American cholesterol, it's about 250. I guess if you're up at 220, they want to prescribe statins for you these days. If you look at the average Chinese cholesterol level, it's down at 127. Then take a look at how many people uh, get heart disease and die in America. It's about 21%. If you look at China, it's 8%. That's how important diet and lifestyle can be for you. 
These are rural Chinese people that haven't got access to McDonald's or anything like that. So they don't tend to eat that kind of way. But then if you look at the, 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 the information from, from this came from T. Colin Campbell, it's a very good book if anybody wants to read it. But he, he said that he, him and his friends, who are all, all eminent heart experts, looked at how many people in the US died from heart disease when they had a cholesterol level of below 150. Not much. If you can get your cholesterol level down in and around that area, you can do a lot towards your survival rate. It's really important because cholesterol can be a lot to do with that. So it's very important. <coughs> but why are fruits and vegetables healthy for you? This is the key. This is why we want to uh, do our research, because we want to look into the mechanisms for why fruits and vegetables are healthy for you. We all know they are, and we all know that we don't eat enough of them. You can ask anybody in this room who actually eats enough fruits and vegetables. Maybe one hand I saw, or two hands. We all know we should be eating more, right? Why are they healthy? What's the mechanism behind it? Well, there's basically four reasons for why fruits and vegetables are healthy for you. First off, they're low calorie and nutrient dense. They are gorgeous, delicious tasting foods. They're colorful, they're attractive, they're really, really nice, right? In addition, they don't have the so-called anti-nutrients. They don't have salt in them. They don't have cholesterol in them. They don't have saturated fat in them. That makes them healthy. We at Dole try to talk about fruits and vegetables by describing what's in them, right? But also what's not in them can be a really important factor for you. And then of course, fruits and vegetables are also full of water and fiber. These things are important because water is basically the biochemical solvent that your metabolism happens if you don't have a lot of water in your system, then that becomes a bit, a bit difficult. Yeah. Good. And then fiber is really important because if you if you have fiber and water in your food, that bulks it up, that makes it less caloric. So you're eating a lot of volumetric, I guess is the word volumetric uh, food, that fills you up, that doesn't come with calories. So you end up actually filling yourself up with that calories. The interesting thing to note is that because fast foods and things, they are very, very sugar laden and fat laden, you can actually get a lot of those nutrients, say nutrients, everybody needs a little bit of fat and a little bit of sugar. You can get a lot of fat and sugar in you without water, without fiber, and therefore it's very easy to get yourself into calorie overload, and that's when you end up putting on weight. So it's really important that you get fruits and vegetables for those reasons. Reason two, macronutrients. Macronutrients are the carbs, the proteins, and the fats that you need. Carbs are required for energy. Um, proteins, of course, we need. They supply a little bit of energy, but more often than not, they're broken down into the constituent amino acids that we can manufacture our own proteins from, that we need for our own metabolism. So that's important. And then, of course, fats. We all need fats, at least some fats. So very important from a structural component. And there are fruits and vegetables that contain some fats, healthy fats, of course, in avocados, there's plenty of nuts and uh, a few other foods. So, these things are available in lots of other foods, but if you're going to get them, you might as well get them in a healthy way, and a healthy way is in fruits and vegetables. Third reason, micronutrients. Micronutrients are the vitamins and minerals that you have in fruits and vegetables. They are essential, which basically means you don't get them in your diet, then you will probably start to suffer from a deficiency disease. Uh, this has been known from, from observation over, over time. For example, if you don't get enough vitamin C in your diet, you end up getting scurvy. Um, I know this because I'm English, and we're often referred to as limeys. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that they used to give us limes on the boat, so we'd get enough vitamin C when we come across the United States, uh, and that would prevent us from getting scurvy. But these things happen, right? And so, over history, we know that if you don't get enough vitamin C, you get scurvy. So it's easy to work out how much vitamin C you need to stop yourself from getting scurvy. So therefore, they have recommended daily amounts. Same for potassium. Let's look at vitamin C, for example. So the RDA that's seen on food labels, currently at the moment, says you need 60 milligrams a day. That could be a bowl of strawberries and orange, um, 
cup of pineapple or something like that. But these food labeling IDAs are quite old, uh, originally back from the 60s. Actuality, uh, the new daily recommended intakes, of which Steve was part or Tony, I believe, um, say that you need 90 milligrams a day if you're a man, and you need 75 milligrams a day if you're a woman. But these amounts are not reflected on the food label. The reason being that they're thought to be too complicated, because there are actually different amounts for if you're age, in the aging population, there are different amounts if you're young. So, actually, we stick with the older version on the label at the moment, which says 60. So it becomes confusing. How much do you really need? And this is only the amount you need to stop yourself from getting scurvy. How much do you need anyway for all your other metabolic functions? We don't really know yet. So, from our perspective, um, it's really important that you get your vitamins and minerals. It's easy to get them from whole foods, especially fruits and vegetables. So that's the way to go. So, if you're interested in getting as much of the vitamins and minerals that you need each day, eat as many fruits and vegetables as you can. Because fruits and vegetables are the most concentrated source of vitamins and minerals that come in whole foods. So there's the first recommendation. Eat as many fruits and vegetables as you can. It's as simple as that. Does anybody remember this guy? Yeah? He gave a talk uh, several months ago uh, as part of this series in 2015, Bruce Ames. How important is it we eat fruits and vegetables and get all our vitamins and minerals? It's very important. Because some of his latest work suggests that the body has evolved to be able to prioritize its use of nutrients. And if you're in a situation where you're in a constant state of undernourishment, i.e. if you're not eating enough fruits and vegetables and you have less amounts of vitamins and minerals in your diet, then your body prioritizes their use and it will push them into processes that are deemed critical and so therefore there's none left over for processes that are deemed non-critical. An example of a critical process would be, say, blood clotting. If you don't have the ability to clot your blood, guess what happens? You're done, right? It's critical that process occurs. An example of a non-critical process is actually DNA repair. So you can imagine in a situation where you are undernourished, anything that is needed for DNA repair might not get to there. So your DNA damage can add up over time. And this is one of the reasons why we think you actually uh, are at higher risk of developing uh, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, etc. as you get older, especially if you're in a state of undernourishment. What's the easiest way to transition yourself from undernourishment, undernourishment to overnourishment? Eat fruits and vegetables. They are the most concentrated sources of vitamins and minerals. And if you want to go from undernourished to nourished, eating fruits and vegetables will actually get you there. So I think it's quite important at this point to talk about supplements in this respect. Hands up who takes a supplement of any kind. That's a large percentage of the room. You might not want to hear what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> we don't advocate the use of supplements. Now, of course, this is a medical thing, and if your doctors tell you to take them, then take them. But, in the real world, <coughs> in a developed country like the United States, if you eat plenty of whole foods and lots of fruits and vegetables, there isn't a reason for you to need supplements, because you can get what you need from a good, healthy, balanced diet. Okay? So, one of the reasons why this might be is that in a food, the nutrient comes with everything else that's in there. Thousands of different things that are in there. And this is important because uh, individual molecules, like a vitamin C molecule, they need to have the right atmosphere to be absorbed or used or become active. And all the other things that are in the fruit or vegetable that it comes in can help with that. If you take that molecule and turn it into a white powder and put it in the pill and put it in the bottle and it's completely isolated from everything else, it might not have the opportunity to be as efficient at being absorbed than the actual uh, vitamin inside the fruit. So that goes a long way to thinking why you might get more benefit out of fruits and vegetables than supplements. 
So if you take a, a, an example, here's, here's a study that was done at Washington University. 168 healthy postmenopausal white women. The average calcium intake that they took from supplements and diets was assessed. They split them up into three groups, those mostly from food, those almost exclusively from supplements, and, and, and the folks that were kind of in the middle that did both. Then they measured their bone mineral density, and they came up with a few uh, results. One is that the calcium intake from food was approximately 20% less than the supplement. You might understand that because the supplements say if you've got a lot of calcium in them, 1,000 milligrams or whatever it happens to be, you can, you can load up on that quite quickly, right? But the bone mineral density was significantly higher in the calcium from food group than it was in the supplement group. So even though these people got less calcium in their diet, they actually had better bone density. So somewhere along the line, the calcium from the food was being better absorbed and better incorporated into the bones than the calcium from the supplements. This could be for a number of reasons, but it's easy to see when you have the calcium in food that comes with all these other things, how that might be due to bioavailability or the ease of incorporation into the metabolism. There are a lot of other things that can help there. So, what does science say about supplements? Well, the key <coughs> findings from the NIH uh, uh, panel, which looked at these things, kind of interesting. <coughs> Insufficient evidence on the benefits and safety of multivitamins and minerals to recommend their regular consumption. Concern that some people might be getting too much of certain nutrients. There is a, such a thing as a vitamin toxicity. If you eat your bowl of cornflakes in the morning, my bowl of cornflakes kind of looks like that. It's probably four or five times the number of cornflakes you should eat at one sitting. And then I have my fortified milk, and then I take a multivitamin, and then I do this, and, that. and by the time I've got to the end of the day, maybe I've had 500% of my B6. Right? It's easy to do. Right? Vitamin toxicity can occur in a supplement world. It tends not to be observed when you eat only whole foods, mainly because you get too full from eating whole foods before you can get to that. Same with calories, you get too full. But there is vitamin toxicity in the supplement world. And also, too, there's little consensus for supporting supplemental use of, of vitamins and minerals in disease risk reduction. So these are their findings from this panel. But I think the key thing that we would like to say is their final finding, is that, okay, that might be true, but really one should focus on your own your key nutrients from whole foods. That's the important thing. Eat food. That's the important thing. So, supplements, at best are they, I think, it's, it, I don't take them, but at best they're always the money to me. Here's an example. A study at Harvard Medical University, 5,442 women at risk for cardiovascular disease. Randomized double blind placebo control study, that's the gold standard where nobody knows what's going on until you unwrap the key at the end. Seven plus years of follow-up, and they supplemented people with folic acid B6 and B12. So, what did they find? Homocysteine, a marker for heart disease, was down by 19%. That sounds great. The plasma levels of these vitamins actually increased. That sounds great. The rate of confirmed, confirmed cardiovascular events, exactly the same. Whether you took these things or not, it was the same rate of cardiovascular events. So for some reason, even though you're piling these supplements into your system, the end result is nothing changes. However, if you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, you do experience a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. That's something that we know. People who eat lots of fruits and vegetables tend not to die from heart disease compared to people who don't. This is a known thing. So, at best they're a waste of money, at worst could they be harmful? There are several studies out there that show supplements actually cause some harm. Uh, most recently, I believe a calcium one um, indicated an increased risk of heart disease or an increased cardiovascular risk of heart disease. Um, selenium is one, I think. And I think there's even a smoking study which had to be stopped early because people started dying when they were supplemented with vitamin A. So, yes, they could be harmful, but only probably in specific areas. But it's something to bear in mind. One thing that isn't, that you should realize is that eating food isn't harmful, especially healthy food. Eating unhealthy food can be harmful. Reason four, 
why fruits and vegetables are healthy for you. Phytonutrients. This is probably the most exciting area of nutrition research today. It's why Dole is at the research campus. It's why we collaborated with Steve Zeisel last year. Um, these are compounds that most people kind of know about now. Plenty of different names, phytochemicals, phytoactives, antioxidants is probably the word that most people understand. You may have heard of some of them, resveratrol in grapes, uh, quercetin in apples. Um, they're usually the types of compounds that give fruits and vegetables their pigments, their colour, their flavour, their aroma, that kind of stuff. So, one of the problems with these things is people often want to know how much should we eat. Well, the problem with phytochemicals is that unlike vitamins and minerals, if you stopped eating them or you didn't eat them anyway, basically in the short term, nothing would happen. So it's easy to work out how much vitamin C you need because if you stop eating it, you get scurvy. And so how much do you have to eat to stop you from doing that? And phytochemicals, if you stop eating them, nothing really happens in the short term. It happens in the long term, which is what we're finding out. But in the short term, nothing happens. And because of that, it's impossible to work out how much do you have to eat. You know, it would be great to say, how much quercetin do you need? Oh, you need four apples worth every day. So you can tell people. We don't, we don't know how much quercetin you need. It's very, very difficult. So this is one of the issues. Um, why do plants have them? Plants have phytochemicals to protect themselves from anything, from the sunlight, from pests, from the myriad of different things. But why are they beneficial to human health? This is where the big uh, question is, and this is what we've actually been looking into. So, what we used to think many years ago, um, and, and quite logically, is that uh, these things function as antioxidants. Now, what's an antioxidant? Let's, let's look at that uh, sort of representation, cartoon representation of an atom there. You've got these two blue electrons flying around the outside. All of a sudden, somebody takes one of those electrons away that molecule becomes very angry then. It wants that electron back so much that it will take it from anywhere. And that's very damaging because it can take it from a protein, it can take it from a DNA molecule, it can take it from anywhere it will get it from. So free radicals or oxidants are very, very dangerous in the body. Antioxidants are good because they have, in that little cartoon on the bottom right, you can see they've got lots of little electrons and they can give them away and not have a problem. So what happens is a free radical comes along, it sees an antioxidant, the antioxidant gives it an electron, that passes across the antioxidant, stops the oxidant from being <coughs> and so you don't have any problems. There's a very simple mechanism, and there's some evidence to suggest it works. Here's another study uh, out of the State University of New York. 32 healthy subjects, they uh, consume 300 calories as either pure glucose or as fresh orange juice, with water as the control. And then their, sample, their blood samples were analysed for ROS or reactive oxygen species, basically free radical type molecules. In the group like glucose group alone, reactive oxygen species was up 130%. That's because when you metabolise sugar, you produce free radicals as part of normal human metabolism. Right? In the water group, because there's no glucose to metabolise, that didn't happen at all. So you've got no reactive oxygen species production. In the orange group, which has loads of sugar and the same 300 calories, guess what? No reactive oxygen species production. That's because the antioxidants in orange juice are preventing those free radicals from forming, or at least uh, nullifying them as soon as they're formed, so they were unable to respond to the measure. An example of how caloric intake in the form of a fresh fruit or vegetable does not induce what they stress in this point. Now the problem is, that's a nice little study, and I like quoting it, but it's just one little study, it's one particular area. The problem with uh, what we know now is that this antioxidant oxygen reason doesn't really explain everything we know about fruits and vegetables. It's uh, problematic from a, a bioavailability standpoint. There's lots of free radicals, and the bioavailability of these compounds is very low, so how can they possibly have an effect? There's lots of reasons. So, we want to look at why we can uh, explain this mechanism. And this is the work I did with, uh, with Steve uh, last year. Now we know that potentially 
these phytochemicals can actually interact with your cells in your body in such a way that when the cell sees them, um, it kicks off a little chain of events inside the cell, which ultimately ends up with the DNA being told to start replicating and producing its own antioxidant systems. So you might, might think that the body itself is very, very good at looking after itself. Humans are very robust. We can live almost anywhere. We get a cold, we get rid of it. Uh, sometimes we can live until 123 and not get any cancer or diabetes or anything like that. The oldest woman in the world with that. Um, sometimes we can smoke for 75 years and we've still got colour in our hair and we're still wandering around and it's working, right? Your genes are very, very good at protecting you. But they're only good when they're turned on. And this is what we think phytochemicals can do. They can show up in the body when you eat fruits and vegetables. They can tell your genes to turn on and start cycling through the protective mechanisms we already have. And effectively put yourself on a heightened sense of alert, if you like. So not only do you want to be overnourished with vitamins and minerals so you don't accumulate damage, you also want to tell your own protection mechanisms to constantly keep going so that any adventitious problem that comes along can be mopped up really quickly before it has a chance of doing any damage. And that's what we think phytochemicals do. So we designed a study in, in Steve's lab about how we could test this. Uh, and after all, we've been looking at um, fruit and vegetable extracts for many years now, and we have samples of um, every fruit and vegetable commonly available in the United States. And where we can split it into either the peel or the flesh, we've done that too. Uh, and created two samples, and we put this whole library of extracts towards the test that was developed in Steve's lab, and we found some pretty interesting things. Here's a breakdown of some of the results we obtained. These are the top 40 of the 140 or 150 we did. Most of them um, activated, but here are the top 40. Um, you might know that avocado peel is the number one activator. I don't know how many people eat avocado peel. No, I don't know. Maybe Chef Mark can tell us how we could do that, or, or maybe not, right? <laughs> but interesting from Dole's perspective were a couple of things. One, bananas were number four. I'm oh, sorry, bananas, I get fired. Up. Pineapples, <laughs> that's interesting to us. We don't know why. We've got a couple of studies going on now where we're looking at why. My suspicion is it's the bromelain in the pineapples. That's a, a proteolytic enzyme that the pineapples have. That could be part of it. But one thing that was very interesting to me was that in the top 40 was iceberg lettuce. Iceberg lettuce, so I've been told, is nothing but water and a bit of vitamin K, and why would you even bother eating it? Right? This, is, this is the vegetables division that are praying for something good about iceberg lettuce because they find it so difficult to sell. Yet it's very, very common if you go to McDonald's and there's a leaf in Big Mac. But, I was thinking, okay, the test's got to be wrong. There's got to be something wrong with the test if iceberg lettuce has showed up. But when you look at it a little bit more closely, romaine, butterhead, and uh, green lettuce also show up. That tells me that there's something in lettuces which responds to this type of test. So maybe lettuces are not just water and a bit of vitamin K. Maybe there's some things in there or combinations of phytonutrients which can cause this upregulation of DNA. And maybe we, uh, we shouldn't be uh, overlooking iceberg lettuce when we're in the supermarket. This is one of the reasons that one of the recipes that Mark has today is an iceberg lettuce recipe. Uh, maybe a novel way to incorporate iceberg lettuce into your diet. Um, so that's what we looked at. Another um, interesting observation was that if you were to look at the peel version sample and the flesh, we found, in many cases, a big discrepancy. The flesh was always much lower activating than the peel. Now this makes sense because most fruits and vegetables preferentially manufacture these phytochemicals in the peels. Because the peels are actually the first line of defense for fruits and vegetables. It's the first thing the sun sees, it's the thing that the pest crawls onto, it's where it needs to concentrate its own protection mechanism. So it's not surprising that actually the peels of a lot of these things were more activating than the flesh. Now, 
we did do some correlations to find out whether there was a, 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 a relationship between how many of these phytochemical molecules are present in the fruit or vegetable and how activating um, the, the extract was, and we didn't find a correlation. So it's definitely not um, a, uh, an amalgamation of all these compounds together. There are probably specific compounds that cause this. And this is just one genetic system. There are many other genetic systems as well, many other genes that code for antioxidant protection. So maybe this list would be slightly different ranked if we looked at another system. But I think the point is, here we offer now a reason for why fruits and vegetables might be healthy for you from a phytochemical perspective. So it's really important that we start to consume these things. Now, let's get down to some diet <coughs> words. So what happens if you eat too many fruits and vegetables? I'm telling you to eat as many as you can. In actuality, you can't eat too many fruits and vegetables. You'll get full first. Maybe people can drink eight, nine, ten cans of Coke a day, but it's pretty hard to eat ten bananas in a day. Right? There was a BBC report recently that said if you ate six, you would die. <laughs> it's not true, I tried it. <laughs> you can eat six bananas quite easily. <coughs> so, but the upshot of it is, because they're um, low in calorie and nutrient dense, your caloric intake is low. You don't end up putting in so much calories that you start to <coughs> gain weight. That doesn't happen. You get full first. You're loaded with vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals. And as we've seen, with vitamins and minerals, you need to be in this state of overnourishment to have everything inside you working properly. And from a phytochemical perspective, you need to be constantly getting your body used to seeing phytochemicals because that's what keeps this, uh, this protection mechanism at its at, at, at red alert, if you like. It's where, where you can be looked after. And if you do these things, if you eat as many fruits and vegetables as you can, you will lower your risk of cancer, diabetes, and America's number one for killer disease, or heart disease. Now, Here's another study. This is quite a long time ago, Dean Ornish, kind of famous study in 1990. But basically, it, it, it shows what I'm talking about. 28 patients with signs of heart disease, 20 controls. They were asked to follow a low fat diet, so 10% of calories from fat, with a plant based diet for one year. And they were told you could eat as much as you want, as long as it's fruits and vegetables and whole grains. They also had a little bit of stress management. And they're also forced to do a little bit of exercise every day, which is important. What we're saying here is fruits and vegetables are good, but it's only half the story. You've got to exercise too. That's an absolute must as well. But results from that study show total cholesterol from 227 at the beginning down to 172. That's not far off the 150 mark. You can just give up on having a heart attack. Right? So that's good. Bad cholesterol down from 150 to 95. Frequency, duration, severity of chest pain plummeted. In fact, 82% of the participants enjoyed a regression in their heart disease over the course of the year. And all they were asked to do was eat as many fruits and vegetables as they could, do a bit of exercise, what they can't afford them to do that, and a little bit of stress management, some meditation. Your, your spirit is also awesome. You need to have that right frame of mind to, to get this going. So it just shows you that, you know, potentially, you can really, really impact your own health by doing three very simple things that are easy to do. So, I could have spent 45 minutes telling you all that stuff when it can be summed up in seven words. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. It's a very famous quote by Marco Polo, an American journalist, and I think it sums it up quite, quite easily. If you follow that edict, you will probably be quite a young person. And if you tell your kids and grandkids to start doing that from when they're three and four years old, all the way through their lives, maybe these are the ones that would like to live to 120, 130, feel like they're 90. This is where we're at today. If you were to ask Mr. Murdoch today whether it will take another 20 years, he would snap your hand up. And he only started eating properly when he was in his 60s. Up until then, he was a billionaire and ate ice cream and steak. Right? So if he'd have been at it since he was four, you wouldn't be laughing when he said he was going to have a 145th birthday. He might get there. Right? So it's that important. 
That's it from me. Um, let's take a couple of questions, if there are any, and then after that, we'll transfer it over to Mark, and he's going to do a little cooking demonstration for you. One, I believe, with bananas, because bananas are very important to the whole, uh, and one with iceberg lettuce, which now we're all going to eat every day. <laughs> so, do we have any questions? Yes? Vitamin D is one of these things where, um, yeah, because you can only get it from the sun, naturally. But there are a few foods that contain vitamin D. There I said vitamin D. <laughs> I've been here too long. Um, but that, that's, that's an issue. You still need 100% of it. You still need to generate that within your skin. But there are a few foods, especially seafoods, some mollusks, things like that, that you can get vitamin D in your food. For the same, same reason. And milk in the United States is fortified with vitamin D. They added some milk by law. I might also mention too that uh, you may have seen mushrooms with high vitamin D content. That is vitamin D2. The stuff that's manufactured in your skin is vitamin D3. They're slightly different. We have done a study where we showed that vitamin D2 is harmful in an athletic setting. So, should you be gaining, have, have a look at your vitamin D supplements if you're taking it, make sure it's D3, that's the safest way to go. I wouldn't really recommend D2. Yes? Um, when you had the slide up there about the different skins, the, you know, like say the red potato skin yes. and all that, what if you add heat to it? So let's say we bake the potato, we yep. bake a red potato, now you've changed the chemical. What have you found about that versus eating it raw versus cooking right. it? Fruits and vegetables are best enjoyed raw more often, but there are some like potatoes that need to be cooked. Um, that's just an acceptable part of the world. Nobody eats raw potatoes, really. Um, cooking is an important process because, here's my view on it, if it's the difference between you eating it and not eating it, eat it. Cook it. Broccoli, for example, has 100% vitamin C. When you cook it, it's only 70. You're not going to eat it because it only has 70% vitamin C now. No, you eat it. It's got a lot of vitamin C eat it anyway. Phytochemicals are pretty robust molecules. And if you cook anything for long enough, you're going to lose everything, right? But, like steaming, heating, microwaving, those sort of more shallow cooking methods, you will lose a little bit, 20, 30, 40% maybe, but because there's such a lot of these things in there, you're going to be getting a good whack of it anyway. The, I think the only cooking method where you lose everything is if you put something in a crock pot for 10 hours. <laughs> yes, sorry. Is there any um, change in the phytochemicals with pesticides? The they, they, they tend not to interact, but you, you, you bring up a good point. I'm, I'm advertising the fact that you should leave the peels on things and eat the peels. That's probably a situation where if you believe the preponderance of evidence that pesticides are bad for you, maybe you should be choosing the organic versions of those things, because then you can get rid of that part. Um, I don't know where I am on the evidence of whether pesticides are harmful for you, whether you get enough of them in the diet to, to cause an issue. I don't know. I've seen plenty of studies that say there isn't, plenty that say there aren't. But if, it, if, if it's the difference between you eating it and not eating it, I'd be inclined to eat it at the moment. But if it is bothersome by the organic version, you can get rid of that. Yes. What about with frozen? My daughter in law just showed me another one that she bought in the freezer case that's a container. You add juice to it. Yes. And what about the benefits of that? Is that considered a fresh? Right, so that's part of the company we sold. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, hopefully, the juice you're adding. Is 100% fresh juice, so there's no, there's not a problem with that. And in generally, it, uh, when you freeze things, you lock in what what you've got there. So if it's flash frozen, <coughs> quickly after being picked, if we're talking about say a commodity fresh fruit vegetable that's frozen, then in actuality, the frozen version can be healthier than the fresh version because the fresh version sits in a transport truck. It gets taken to the store, it sits in the back, it gets put out the front, you buy it, it goes in the trunk of your car for six hours while you're in cold. Then you take it home, then you might not eat it for three days. The frozen one stays exactly the same as it was when it was frozen. Right? So 
if it splash frozen and frozen very quickly, frozen can be just as healthy, if not healthier than the fresh. But again, if that's the difference between you eating it and not eating it, it doesn't make any difference, just to eat it. Yeah. Okay, one last question, yes. Uh, I've come across some information that says that um, some of those peelings are impossible to digest. I would just wonder if um, you have any suggestions or comments about maybe how to improve that. Well, um, the digestive system is very good at breaking down plants. So um, I would hate to suggest that uh, we could actually digest avocado peels. I have no idea. They look like they're impossible to digest, but I wouldn't be surprised if we could digest them to a certain extent. But honestly, with fruits and vegetables, I don't think you'd really have a problem with that, really. Okay, well, let's move across to the chef, who's going to teach us now. Uh, uh, now, I'm sorry that uh, it might be difficult for you to see. If you, if you might want to move down in front a little bit, there's plenty of room down here. You can actually see what Mark's up to. But uh, this is our first time demonstrating to uh, a large audience in this space. So please forgive us if you don't get to see much. But if you're on the front of the road, you've got a perfect view. You can try and look in the mirror. You can see what he's doing with his hands in there. But let me hand you over to Mark, Alison, Chef of Culinary. Thank you, Nick. Good evening. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yep, I might have a problem with the uh, sight, but not sound, hopefully. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. I know it's uh, getting chilly outside, so uh, thank you indeed for coming. This is our first time <coughs> in this event, so let's see how it goes. It might be the first time of many, who knows. So, how do you incorporate fruits and vegetables into your normal eating habits? I was very lucky in the fact that my father was a keen gardener and my mother was a keen cook. So I've just grown up with fruits and vegetables. Now I've got three boys, it's trying to get them to eat fruits and vegetables. Two of them, not too bad. But the third one, the youngest, who's just turned 13, he only eats potatoes. <laughs> Mashed potatoes or fried. And that's it. I'll put broccoli on his plate every night and carrots and he'll always leave them till the end and then he'll pretend that he's eaten. <laughs> One night I went into the restroom and then I realized how every night he'll leave the head of broccoli until the end and I'll say, right dad, can I leave? And I'll say, yeah, eat your broccoli, pops it in his mouth and then he disappears. <laughs> One night I go in the restroom and what's floating in the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> the broccoli. He was doing that every night. So now I'm going to force him to sit there and chew on this broccoli. But over time, I know that he'll change. Okay, And that's what it is with children these days. Over time, you've just got to be persistent and get them to change. Now, would you believe I'm 75? <laughs> that is because I've grown up on fruits and vegetables. Hard to believe I know. Actually, 51. I thought I was I thought I was 21 last weekend in the gym when I was working out in Ninja Me Back. I've got to realize now I'm getting out of it. So anyway, what I've got tonight is we're going to do a green smoothie. Can you remember uh, the wedge salad? Yeah, it sort of like disappeared because everybody thought, well, there's no nutrition in iceberg. Well, we're going to bring it back tonight, so we've got that to try. And then we've got an appetizer as well. Now, so for the smoothie, I've got some almond milk, okay? Now if you want, you can use normal milk or you can use water. I've got some almond milk that's going to go in. This is my Vitamix that I brought in from, from uh, my house this morning. This is an expensive piece of machinery, but I use it twice a day. So when I went to buy this, I thought, well, it's going to cost us a dollar a day, over a year. I might as well buy the best. So if you're going to make smoothies, look at the machine you're going to buy. You want something that's got a really good power, to a power source engine and something that's reliable. This is guaranteed for a lifetime, okay? So you want to buy something that's going to last. We've got some pineapple, okay? Loads of phytochemicals. We've got some almonds, which is a super food. We're going to put them in. Avocado. Now, the one I made earlier, just for you guys, I left the skin on. <laughs> so, the one I'm going to drink in front of is going to taste absolutely fabulous. 
when you leave tonight, you can tell me what the sample tasted like. Okay? Then we've got some mango. And what I normally do is I've got three boys that I look after, and I make all my smoothies on the night time, and then I just pop it in the fridge, and then it's ready first thing in the morning. Mini bananas, like <coughs> that Nick talked about. I'm going to put one of them in as well. And we're just going to pop all of that into that mix, and then it's already set on to make a smoothie. Make sure you buy a good knife. The knives I've got, I've been a chef since I was 16 years old. I've traveled around the world. I've still got the same set of knives that I bought when I was 16. If you invest in a good knife, it'll last your lifetime. Okay? Keep them sharp. Buy a white stone. You can get them at the Asian market. They're about $5. It's easy to use. It's essential that you keep your knife sharp because you'll not cut your fingers. If you've got a dull blade, you're going to add more pressure to the knife, and that's when you're going to put yourself. Okay? Now, if you see on the TV, and <laughs> all this chopping is totally unnecessary. Okay? What you want to try and do is keep your blade to the board all the time, and you shouldn't really hear any noise. Okay? So, we've got an onion. When you're going to cut an onion, what you want to do is leave the root on. Okay? Leave the root on the end. That will keep the onion together and it will also, also stop you from crying. Because as soon as you put through that root, that's what gets in the air, the zest of the onion, and that's what's going to make you cry. Okay? All of these different things, whether you put the spoon on your nose or wear a pair of goggles, they don't work. Okay? What you need is to leave the root on and have a sharp knife. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're just going to cut through the onion. And we're going to use this as our base of our salsa. So I've just cut through, and then I'm going to cut across, and then I'm going to cut through, and then we've got some small dice. Okay? So that's our onion. We're going to pop that into a bowl. 
Then we've got some beautiful tomatoes. And what I'm just going to do is cut them in half, cut them in a quarter, take out the eye, and then we're going to take out the seeds. And we're not going to throw anything away because if I was at home, I would use them seeds in a stock. Or if I was making pasta sauce, I would just pop them in and use the seeds as well. Just because we're making a salsa, we want to try and get rid of the seeds because we want to keep it just so we've got the flesh. So we're taking them seeds out. Just remove them from all of them. And then all you need to do then is turn it over, take your knife, and you just rock in the knife backwards and forwards. And you're making dice. Okay? So all you're going to do, rock your knife backwards and forwards. You can see I'm keeping my fingers out of the way. Okay? Because what you want to try and do with your hand, that hasn't got the knife in, is grip the food item and keep your finger nails or your fingertips underneath your knuckles. Okay? So the knife is always just on the knuckles. That way you'll not cut your finger ends off. So, we've got our onion, we've got our tomato going in. I've already done so beforehand. We've got a lime. And what you want to do with a lime or a lemon to get the most juice out of it is basically just roll it on your chopping board, okay? And that breaks down all the segments. Because if you've ever just cut into a lime before and then you try, try to squeeze it like a bullet, okay? You just want to roll it slightly, cut it in half, cut it in a quarter, and then squeeze all that juice out. Okay? So, we've got loads of fresh vegetables going on there. We've got a jalapeno. We're going to cut that in half. We're going to cut that in a quarter. We're going to take out the seeds because it's the seeds that are the hottest part of the pepper. And then we're just going to slice this in half, slice the other half, again, and then again we're just rocking our knife backwards and forwards. I can look at you, I don't have to worry about my fingers because my fingertips are under the knuckles. Okay? So we've got a nice little dice there. That's going in with the tomatoes. One word of caution, when you're using a pepper, it's one of the few times that you should wash your hands when you go to the restroom, okay? <laughs> Especially if you're a guy, because your fingertips are going to be relatively warm or hot, and if you don't wash your fingers, you're going to be coming out screaming, <laughs> wishing for a nice pack, okay? So make sure you always wash your hands after you've dealt with some chili. We've got some cilantro. Roughly chop that up. Add it to your bowl. We've got some extra virgin olive oil. We're going to stir that together. You want to taste everything you make. I don't typically use salt, but I like to use black pepper. So we're going to add some black pepper. That's our salsa there. And then what we're going to do is I've got a piping bag. I just made this out of paper. I'm going to put some yogurt in this, Greek yogurt. Wrap this up. Just because I want to be fancy tonight. Take that tip off. And then we've got our iceberg lettuce. We're just going to break this down slightly. And open it up a little bit. We're going to take our salsa <coughs> and we're just going to put this salsa on top of the iceberg and around. Okay, then we've got our piping bag. You can just use a spoon if you want, and we're just going to drizzle that around. Get some black pepper. From above, so it goes all over, and then you've got an easy wet start.
Okay, so you've got a wet salad to try, you've got a smoothie with the avocado skin on to try, and the last thing we're going to do tonight, this is my signature dish, I always like to do this, and whenever I make it at home or make it at a party, I've never heard anybody dislike this yet. Unfortunately, you have not got this to try tonight <laughs> because it would be quite difficult for me to make a hundred portions of this this afternoon. But if you want to come up later, you can try. Okay. What we've got is we've got some melon, and I've got a melon baller. Okay. And all I'm going to do is take out balls of melon and drop them into a bowl. And you can use any melon you want. In fact, sometimes when I do this. I use honeydew, watermelon, cantaloupe, anything just to give extra, extra texture, extra colour, extra flavour. You can, if you haven't got a melon baller, just use a knife and just chop out cubes. Okay? So, we've got our melon in the bowl. We have got a red chili. This time we're just going to open it up. I like to use a Thai chili. Couldn't get one yesterday, but I like to use a Thai one because it's got a nice sweet heat to it. We're just going to chop this up. Again, keeping your fingers out of the way so it's nice and small. Put that in with the melon. We have got some. Does anybody use fish stock, fermented fish stock, if you're making Chinese or Indian food? Well, if you smell this, what's it smell like? It always reminds me of my wife's calm and sweaty feet. <laughs> I used to refuse to dry my wife's calm. She would pick up my three boys and they would be playing soccer or rugby or whatever. They'd get in the car and obviously strip off, socks came off, and that's all he could smell in the car. <laughs> Happened once in my car, I refused to pick up the boys after that. <laughs> but this is what it smells like. It's terrible. But, Believe me, when you come and taste this, you will not be able to taste that smell with all the other ingredients. It comes out beautiful. We've got some organic honey as a sweetener. We're going to put that in. We've got a little bit of garlic. And what you want to do with garlic is just crush it with the back of your knife. Okay? Break it up, and then again, keeping your fingers out of the way, roughly chop. And like with garlic, the further you break it down, the more flavour you release. Okay? So just bring it down. If you want to, you can put a little bit of salt on this and grate it, but it actually doesn't need it. You just take the back of your knife and you break it down and you turn it into a paste. One day I cook the next. We had this policy, whoever cooked, the other person washed. When I used to finish, we'd have the plates. When my wife used to cook, I'd have a disaster. <laughs> okay, <coughs> same with the lemon, okay? Just roll your lemon, you're going to break down the segments. We're just going to take some lemon juice to add to this and squeeze it onto the melon. We want the zest and the juice of the lime, okay? So, we've got a zester here, and we're just going to take off the very thin layer of zest from the lime. And if you notice, what I'm trying to do is add a lot of flavour to everything I make, without adding too much salt. So, we've got some cilantro, and we've got some mint. Now we're just going to take our knife, bring it together like a ball, okay? Take your knife again, remember you're just rocking backwards and forwards. And all you're going to do is roughly chop up this mint and cilantro. You can see I've got this hand on the front of the blade, so 
So there's no way that I can possibly cut myself. The only way I could is if I've got a dull blade, okay, and I'm putting too much pressure on the knife. So you add any herbs. We've got some almonds and we've got some shrimp. I did this recipe on TV once, went through the whole recipe, it was brilliant, and then I looked down and the shrimp was still there. <laughs> Not one person had noticed that I never put the shrimp in. <laughs> Tastes good without the shrimp, by the way. Okay. <laughs> then we'll put the shrimp in, and then we're just going to take a spoon, and we're going to mix that all together. This could be made the day before, but I wouldn't add the shrimp, okay? All I've done with the shrimp was I steamed it for two minutes. If you add the shrimp too early, because of all the acidity in this dish, it'll break down the flesh of the shrimp, okay? So, then, um, if I'm gonna have this as an um, appetizer for a party at home, I take a martini glass, and I just pile this in. If you're gonna make it for a friend, is a side dish and take it to somebody's house, I would just put it in a normal container. And the problem that you normally find, especially if you take it to somebody's house, the kids come along and eat all the shrimp and leave them out. <laughs> and then we're just going to put a little bit of mint in the top there, and that's our lemon and shrimp cocktail. I didn't want to do that because I'm not anything for But thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. you did. Yes, sir. You know what? I, I was only kidding about the avocado peel, by the way. Okay. Uh, Nick would probably be able to answer that better than me. I think that's another one of the ones where I, d I don't know anybody that's tried it, to be honest. Why don't you have a go and let us know? That, yes. looks, that looks pretty tough. I think that would be difficult to, to, to do. Where do you get this artist stuff? Uh, actually, you can get it at Harris Tina. If you go to the international section, it'll be there. So it's just actually. It's, yeah. it's actually called yeah. Nam Pan, but it, it'll be under fermented fish stock as well. It's actually, called? Harris Tina do their own brand. Oh, so that's what it's called fish stock? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, fermented fish stock. Which one? People have paid thousands of dollars for that recipe. <laughs> Do you really want to give it to you for nothing to pay? Yes. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Jennifer, there's all our PR. Jennifer will put it on the website somewhere. Oh, okay. It's on the website. Do you pay? People have not paid for that recipe. <laughs> Actually, this is, but this is my signature dish, you know, like normal chefs will have a dish. This is my signature dish I've been doing for 12 years. But feel free to make it and tell people that you came over this. What's the website address? <laughs> Transformingsite.com, or you can go to the UNCNRI and the news on both websites. Any more questions? Yes, sir. I wanted to. Uh, see if there were comment about how much of the watermelon rind you can eat. You know, you have the kind of whitish part, and then oh, right. Um, again, that you know that would come for personal taste uh, because it, it was basically no flavor whatsoever. If you're looking at phytochemicals or the nutrition part, then Nick would probably best answer that. But as a, uh, there's, there's plenty of uh, phytochemicals in watermelon rind, especially. So it's certainly a, um, a rind or a peel that has a reasonable amount of nutrition in it. But as with all these things, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist, so I can say, oh yeah, it's loaded with the things. Can I give you a recipe with it in it? No. <laughs> That's why we need people like Mark to, to, to investigate that. And then you look in the near future when we, we're, we're hoping to uh, have a test and development kitchen here in Annapolis, we can look at those things and try and investigate how we can incorporate those things into, into the garden. That's, that's the view. What do you look for in the store? Oh, sorry. 
What did you look for in a good knife? Or uh, what brand did you use? Uh, actually, virtually all of my knives are Sabadier knives. Uh, you've got Pinkle, you've got uh, uh, a lot of variety of European knives, but I, I, I tell you what, the American knives are just as good. But I would be looking at something that is one piece of metal, okay, all the way through, and then the handle, the handle added, okay, and it wants to be a pretty heavy sort of knife, okay. And you buy a knife for say a hundred dollars, it's going to last you fifty years. And don't buy serrated knives, the ones I see on the TV that are supposed to never get dull. They're wasteful. I was just going to say just there uh, before you, this tastes absolutely wonderful. <laughs> you need to try. Yes, madam. Pumpkin peel. I cook a lot of pumpkin and puree and I'm always tempted to throw the peel in there so I don't have to you, pumpkin. You know what? Do it. Even Do it. Dirt from the ground well, I'm washing the dirt off. <laughs> <laughs> Wash it off, but I would give it a try. You know, it's like when I teach, I used to be the Dean of Culinary Arts at Johnson Wales University, so I had 1,400 students that I used to deal with every day. And I would tell them, a recipe is just a recipe. You know, you've got to play with it to what you think will turn out a nice recipe. So if you want to add pumpkin peel, then add pumpkin peel. You know, you've got 365 days of the year, if it doesn't turn out on that one day, then you've got 364 to sort of tweak it until it does. And if after a year it doesn't, then just forget about the question. <laughs> and if somebody had already done that, then they could answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say with all the fresh fruits and vegetables are very easy to play with. Play with them. Yeah. Alter your recipes, change things around, see what you like. If it's a way to incorporate more into your diet, it's a great way to do it. That's it. That's right. Anything that's going to get the kids to eat more. I'm very lucky in the fact that I was brought up with parents that grew fruits and vegetables. My middle son, my 30, my not 30 year old, my middle son who just turned 18 on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, he's a type 1 diabetic. He actually became the youngest type 1 diabetic uh, when we lived in Alaska. The first time I came to America, um, I thought I was going to California. And I thought I was going to lie on a beach and sunbathe all year. And I ended up in Alaska for a year. Okay? Uh, but we had a great time. We lived in a log cabin. We had wild bear running down the street. I was fishing for salmon every other day. But my middle son became a type 1 diabetic at the age of 14 months. He is now 18, just turned 18 last week. He has grown up on fruits and vegetables. He is one of the fittest, healthiest persons I've ever met. Yes, sir. I have two questions from the, the uh, live stream. Um, can you repeat the brand of the knife? One. Sabadia. 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 Thank you, Steve. <coughs> um, you got ink as well. Won't keeping the smoothie in the fridge overnight <coughs> due to nutritional properties? Uh, not if it's wrapped and covered well. Shouldn't. Yeah, okay. Yes, Mark? Um, if you don't get organic fruits and vegetables, you know what, I just read about that the other day and it basically said that more than likely just cold water instead of making a solution. You could,